Chapter 31 Seeing the War It was not until the morning of October 5th that I learned that the Hanover machine, which Reed Chambers and I had shot down on October 2nd, was still lying under guard of our doughboys but a mile or so north of Montfaucon. It seemed to be in good condition, and the officers there had telephoned to us to send out and bring it into our hangars. I might say in passing that it is extremely rare to find an enemy machine within our lines that has not been cut to pieces for souvenirs by the thousand and one passers-by before it has been on the ground a single hour. It is marvelous how quickly a crowd gathers at the sight of a crashed machine. Motor drivers leave their trucks on the road and dash across the fields to examine the curiosity and to see if they cannot find a suitable souvenir straight from Germany to carry away with them. From every direction, soldiers and French peasants come running to the wreck. By the time the pilot gets safely landed and makes his way to the scene, there is little of the enemy machine remaining. Up to this time, the American Air Force had never captured one of these two-seater Hanover machines. We were all of us anxious to fly different types of German airplanes, to compare them with our own, to examine what new devices they employed, to test their engines, and to see towards what improvements their designers were tending. So as soon as we heard that our victim of the 2nd of October had landed without crashing, and was being cared for near Montfaucon, we lost no time in getting into an automobile and making our way to the front lines. It was raining the morning we set off, and no flying was likely to be possible until after midday at best. We ran west and north until we struck the eastern edge of the famous Argonne Forest at Varennes, and there we began to get graphic pictures of the results of the gigantic artillery duel that had been going on for the last fortnight between the American forces and the Germans. The roads from Varennes to Montfaucon were almost entirely remade. Along both sides of the road, for as far as the eye could reach, the shell holes covered the landscape as thickly as in almost any part of no man's land. The soil was the familiar yellow clay. Since the rainfall, the country through which we were passing resembled a desolate, fever-stricken swamp. The trees were sheared of their branches, and even the trunks of large trees themselves were cut jaggedly in two by the enemy's shells. Occasionally the ugly base of a dud shell could be seen protruding six or eight inches from the tree's trunk. The nose had buried itself squarely in the tree, but for some reason the shell had failed to explode. And along the whole way numberless strings of motor trucks were passing and repassing, some laden with ammunition, food, medical and other supplies hurrying to the front lines, dodging as they splashed through the slimy mud the slower-going processions of heavy guns. Long lines of empties were coming against this stream, many of them not empty, it is true, but filled with the wounded who were being carried back to a field hospital for amputations or other surgical operations. Occasionally we would find ourselves blocked as the whole procession came to a halt. Somewhere up the line a big twelve-inch gun had slithered around across the road and had completely blocked all traffic. On several occasions we waited half an hour before the road was cleared and the procession again proceeded. I do not know whether other observers have been impressed with the appearance of our American doughboys in the same way I have, but to me there seemed to be an extraordinary cheerfulness about the demeanor of these boys, whether they were coming in or going out of action. They were always smiling. Long lines of khaki-clad Americans marching two abreast, often enough preceded by several officers, likewise marching on foot through the mud at the head of the column. All were whistling, singing, smiling as they hiked along at route step. They made caustic comments as their roving eyes struck anything comic or unusual in the scenes around them. Failing such opportunities, they ragged one another or recalled such incidents as might be expected to excite hilarity or amusement. They invariably were a happy and cheerful lot. Column after column we passed going in. Column after column we met coming out. Finally we left the main road, and struck a slightly less congested but far more disreputable road, which led us up to the crest of the hill on which stood Montfaucon. Guns of the Americans were sounding behind us now, and ahead we heard the enemy guns steadfastly replying. The town itself was nevertheless occupied by some of our troops, and a YMCA hut had been opened within the ruins of a little shop on Main Street, at about the center of the winding settlement. Here we stopped and left our car at the side of the street. A long queue of doughboys stood in line, waiting to get to the rude shop window, where 
chocolate and cigarettes were being sold as fast as the two YMCA officers could pass them out. We entered the side door and warmed our muddy boots before a small open fire burning in the center of the floor of what had once been the kitchen. Here we ate a lunch of biscuits and chocolate while we questioned the men as to the exact location of the aeroplane we had brought down. A mile or so nearer the enemy trenches to the north of the town, the machine was lying quite unhurt, we were informed. We again took our car and made our way slowly through the narrow and desolate streets. On both sides the stone and mortar buildings had been leveled almost flat. The streets had been completely filled with the debris of bricks, beams, and rubble, but enough space had been cleared through the center to permit one vehicle to pass at a time. As we reached the edge of the town, we saw one substantial building on the very topmost point of the hill which, though badly battered, still stood the most conspicuous and most pretentious object in Montfaucon. We instantly recognized it from our numerous observations from the air. It was the residence of the Crown Prince through those early campaigns against Verdun of 1915-1916. through 1916. More recently, it had been occupied by the general commanding the German armies, which had been opposing the American drive against the Argonne, and now it was in our hands. Leaving the car, we walked up to make an inspection of this celebrated headquarters. It stood upon a ledge of rock, which hung over the hillside from its very peak. Around its base was a huge mountain of reinforced concrete, from six to eight feet in thickness. From within, one caught a wonderful view of the whole surrounding country. The Meuse Valley could be followed to a point well below Verdun, and the whole of the Argonne patch of woods lay under the eye from this lofty tower. The German Hanover machine we found just beyond the town. It was indeed in remarkably good condition. It had glided down under the control of the pilot, and had made a fairly good landing, considering the rough nature of the ground. The nose had gone over at the last moment, and the machine had struck its propeller on the ground, breaking it. The tail stood erect in the air, resting against the upper half of a German telegraph pole. A few ribs in the wings were broken, but these could easily be repaired. Our mechanics, with their truck and trailer, had already arrived at the spot, and were ready to take down the wings and load our prize onto their conveyance. A newly dug grave a few yards away indicated the last resting place of the observer that my bullets had killed in air. The pilot had been sent back to one of our hospitals for treatment. A bullet had pierced his face, shattering his jaw. While the mechanics were taking the Hanover apart for loading, we proceeded on to one of our observation posts facing the German lines, where we got a close-up view of a regular war. It was a spectacle never to be forgotten. Through the periscopes I saw the German trenches just opposite me, behind which our shells were dropping with a marvelous accuracy. They were passing over my head, with a continuous whine and the noise and jarring crump of their explosions so near our post made it necessary to shout our conversation into one another's ears. Enemy shells were passing overhead contrary-wise, mostly directed at our artillery men far in our rear. Our shells were creeping back nearer and nearer to the open ditches in which the German troops were crouching. I watched the gradual approach of this deadly storm in complete fascination. Some gigantic hand seemed to be tearing up the earth in huge handfuls, forming ugly yellow holes from which sprang a whirling mass of dirt, sticks, and dust. And nearer and nearer to the line of trenches this devastating annihilation was coming. To know that human beings were lying there without a possible means of escape, waiting there while the pitiless hailstorm of shrapnel drew slowly closer to their hiding places, seemed such a diabolical method of torture that I wondered why men in the trenches did not go utterly mad with terror. Suddenly I noticed that our gunners had drawn back their range to the exact line of the trenches. A first shell fell directly into the trench in front of me, tearing it open and gutting it completely for a space of thirty feet. The next instant a Bosch soldier sprang out of the trench alongside this point, and flinging down his rifle, proceeded to run for all he was worth back to a safer zone in the rear trenches. Hardly had he gone ten yards when a high-explosive shell lit in front of him. Before I saw the burst of the shell, I saw him stop with his arms flung over his head. Next instant he was simply swept away in dust and disappeared as the explosion took effect. Not a vestige of him remained when the dust had settled and the smoke had cleared away. At five o'clock the men had our Hanover loaded on their trailer, and we were ready to depart for home. Passing down the Montfaucon Hill by another road, 
we came upon a row of concrete dugouts built into the side of the hill by the Germans, but now occupied by American troops. Doubtless the Huns had expected this occupation by their enemies, and had waited for a few days to make certain that the little huts would be well filled with our troops before springing their surprise. Just as we approached this group of buildings, the first German shell fell full into the middle of them. The Huns had gotten the exact range the first shot. Lieutenant Chambers and I were cut off from our road, and for a few minutes we had the panic of our lives. A motor truck a short way ahead of us, which was likewise standing still waiting for the storm to pass, got a direct hit and was blown into fragments. Reed and I waited for no more, but made a bolt for the nearest shelter we could find. Flat on our faces, at the bottom of a nearby trench, we listened to the shells bursting about our ears. While not wishing any ill luck to any other poor chaps, we did most fervently hope that the Huns had not miscalculated their range by two hundred yards in our direction. A bold glance over the top of our parapet showed that the concrete buildings were already a mass of dust. Just then, one shell landed not fifteen feet in front of my nose, and I threw up my feet and struck the water in the bottom of my ditch as hard as possible with my face. As suddenly as it had started, the bombardment ceased. Frugal souls, these Bosch are. Not a shell too few, not one too many, is their very efficient motto. But we did not trust to this motto for several more minutes, and when we did cautiously emerge from our hole, we spent several more minutes washing the clay mud from our uniforms. One more extraordinary spectacle Reed Chambers and I witnessed on that memorable day. Not two miles further on, we espied a formation of nine Fockers pass overhead, proceeding at a very low level in the direction of our rear. The sky was still cloudy and threatening, but no rain was falling. We stopped the car, to avoid being mistaken for a general and thus attracting Fokker bullets through our car. Both of us jumped out and ran to an open space where we could see in what direction the Hun pilots were directing their course. As we looked up through the trees, we saw over our heads two darting spots coming down straight at the tail of the Hun procession from a high altitude. Although we could not distinguish whether they were American or French, we knew even at that distance that the two pursuing machines were spods. It was probably the most exciting moment Reed or I had ever experienced. We both shouted for joy to see the clever stalking of such a superior force by the two brave spods. Moreover, this was the first air battle that either of us had ever seen from the ground, and it afforded us a panorama of the whole that is impossible to get from the center of a fight. The two peaking spods opened fire on their downward course when at only three thousand feet above ground. Their aim was not good, however, and neither of the attacked machines received a vital hit. Then the scene of action became one churning mass of revolving and looping aeroplanes. The leading Fokkers had reversed directions and were attacking the spods. These latter did not keep together, but each was carrying on a separate freelance combat, occasionally pouring out streams of flaming bullets at any enemy machine that crossed its path. For a good five minutes or longer the aerial tumult continued, without any further results than giving us spectators below a most beautiful exhibition of contortions and airmanship. I was full of admiration for the two aviators who, I was now almost certain, must be Americans and must belong to our group. At any rate, they were brave fellows to stick so long against such odds. Then we saw two machines coming our way out of control. They were some distance away, but since they were headed towards Germany and were not being pursued, it was very evident that they were Fokkers. The two brave spots had been victorious. Soon both wounded Fokkers were passing directly above us. Motors cut off, and steadily losing height, one was absolutely certain to crash near us, while the other seemed still to be under the control of its pilot. They were Fokkers, sure enough. As we looked back to the scene of the recent combat, we saw the spots streaking it homewards, with the balance of the Fokkers strung out behind them in a useless pursuit. No Fokker can overtake a good spot, unless he has sufficient advantage in elevation to increase his speed by diving. The victorious spots lost themselves in the distant clouds, and the Fokkers, after reforming their depleted numbers, returned to their lines some distance to the east of us. The last we saw of the two victims, one had crashed, nose down, at less than a mile from where we stood. The other had succeeded in gliding almost two miles further, finally crashing, as we ascertained next day, in no man's land just north of Montfaucon. The day was getting late, and our progress home would be slow owing to the enormous traffic on the roads, 
so we did not take time to visit the spot of the nearest Fokker's Fall. Thus we returned joyfully homewards, after a most exciting and successful day, with our captured two-seater Hanover safely following along behind. And at mess that night, to crown our satisfaction, we learned that the two victorious spot operators, who had that afternoon added two more victories to the score of 94 Squadron, were sitting opposite us, grinning with complacency. They were Lieutenant Jeffers and Lieutenant K. The following morning we received explicit orders to bring down an enemy balloon that was hanging above the enemy town of Maroc, about four miles inside their lines. Lieutenants Coolidge and Cook armed their guns with special ammunition, and accompanied by six other planes as a protective escort, we set off early in the morning and attained, undiscovered, a good position behind the balloon. Coolidge started a first attack, with Cook following him in case he was unsuccessful. But Coolidge was not unsuccessful. His first burst set fire to the target, and Cookie was obliged to make a sudden bank to avoid its threatening flames. Without further molestation than the usual archie fire of the front, we returned to our aerodrome without having seen a single enemy aeroplane in the sky. It had been quite the simplest balloon strafing party in which we had ever been engaged. No further victories came to our squadron, owing to the continuous bad weather, until October 9th, when, at about five in the afternoon, I had my machine pushed out into the mud of the aerodrome and got away through the clouds for a short survey of the lines. No enemy machines were out, but I discovered a balloon watching our front from a point just back of Dans sur Meuse. Making a wide detour to lose myself from their sight, I came back at Dans from the rear just as it was getting so dark that it would be difficult for them to distinguish my machine from any considerable distance. But it was also too dark for me to do any observing from balloons, and the Bosch had hauled their drachen down for the night. I passed the spot twice before I could make out the outline of the sleek gas bag from my low height of only two hundred feet above ground. Then, taking a fresh start, I made two attacks at it in its nest before I succeeded in setting it afire. It finally caught with a sufficient glow to light up the whole country around, including several machine gun pits and archie batteries which I discovered were frantically firing at me. Their aim was bad, however, and I flew safely back to the hangars and landed to receive the information that the result of my patrol had been witnessed by our balloon posts south of Don, and confirmation already had been telephoned in. It was my sixteenth official victory. Chapter 32 A Regular Dogfight On the afternoon of October 10th, the 94th Squadron received orders to destroy two very bothersome enemy balloons, one of which was located at Donsermuse, the other at Ancreville. The time for this attack was fixed for us at 3.50 p.m. sharp. A formation of defending planes from 147 Squadron was directed to cover our left wing, while a similar formation from the 27th was given the same position on our right. I was placed in command of the expedition and was to arrange all minor details. Selecting Lieutenants Coolidge and Chambers to act as the balloon executioners, I sent orders to all the pilots who were to accompany our secret raid to assemble their formation at 3,000 feet above Montfaucon at 3.40 o'clock precisely. Then, with Coolidge and Chambers ahead of us, the United Force would proceed first to the Don Balloon, where we would protect the two strafers against Hun aeroplanes while they went in to attack their objective. Then, after destroying the first, if circumstances permitted, we should proceed on to Ancrevi, destroy that balloon, and beat a retreat straight for home. If Coolidge and Chambers encountered any hostile aircraft, they were instructed to avoid fighting, but retire immediately to the protection of our formation. A clear afternoon made it certain that the Bosch machines would be thick about us. According to our secret intelligence reports, the enemy had here concentrated the heaviest air force against the Americans that had ever been gathered together since the war began. Both the Richthofen Circus and the Lozer Circus were now opposed to us, and we had almost daily seen the well-known red noses of the one and the yellow-bellied fuselages of the other. Also, we had distinguished the checkerboard design of the number three Jagstoffel and the new scout machines which the Huns had but lately sent to the front. The Seaman Schuchard, which was driven by a four-bladed propeller and which had a much faster climb than had the Spad. Further reports which came to us stated that the new Fokkers, now arriving at the front, had four instead of two guns mounted forward, two, as of yore, fastened along the engine top, and two others attached to the top wing. 
Personally, I have never seen one of these Roman candle affairs, which so startled several pilots who reported having fights with them. They may have been in use along our front, of course, but I have never met one, nor seen a pilot who was certain he had met one. It was said that when all four guns began firing their tracer bullets at an enemy machine, the exhibition resembled the setting off a Fourth of July Roman candles, so continuous a stream of tracer bullets issued from the nozzles of the four machine guns. This heavy consolidation of enemy aircraft along our front was necessary to the Germans for two reasons. The retreating Hun infantry must hold the Meuse front until they had time to withdraw their troops from Belgium and the north, or the latter would be cut off. Secondly, the Allied bombing squadrons, which were now terrifying the Rhine towns, were all located along this front, and must be prevented from destroying those Prussian cities so dear to the heart of the Hun. General Tronchard of the British Independent Air Force proved he was right when he demonstrated that his bombing of enemy cities would necessarily withdraw from the battlefront much of the enemy's air strength to defend those helpless cities against such attacks. So it is not necessarily to be believed that Germany was actually in such fright over the appearance of the American airmen that she straightaway sent all her best aviators to the Verdun region to oppose us. She really had quite other objects in view, but such a move nevertheless resulted in filling the skies opposite us with the best fighting airmen in the German service. It promised to be a busy month for us. Fourteen of my spods then left the ground on October 10th at 3.30 in the afternoon with eight of 147's machines and seven of those from 27 squadron taking their places on the right and left of us as arranged. I pushed my spod number one up several thousand feet above the flotilla to watch their progress over the lines from a superior altitude. The enormous formation below me resembled a huge crawling beetle, Coolidge and Chambers flying in the exact position ahead of them to form the stingers. Thus arranged, we proceeded swiftly northwest in the direction of Donsermuse. We arrived over the lines to be welcomed by an outlandish exhibition of Archie Fury, but despite the large target we made, no damage was received and none of our spods turned back. Reaching a quieter region inside German territory, I looked about me. There indeed was our Don Balloon floating tranquilly in the sunshine. It was 3.40 by my watch. We had ten minutes to maneuver for position and reach our objective. I looked down at my convoy and found that 147's formation at the left had separated themselves somewhat widely from the others. Then, studying the distant horizon, I detected a number of specks in the sky, which soon resolved themselves into a group of eleven Fokkers flying in beautiful formation and evidently just risen from their aerodrome at Stenay, a dozen miles beyond Don. They were approaching from the west and must reach the detached formation of 147's pilots before the rest of my flight could reach them, unless they immediately closed up. I dived down to dip them a signal. On my way down I glanced around me and saw approaching us from Metz in quite the opposite direction another formation of eight Fokkers. Certainly the Huns had wonderful methods of information which enabled them to bring to a threatened point this speedy relief. While I debated an instant as to which danger was the most pressing, I looked below and discovered that the enemy balloon men were already engaged in pulling down their observation balloon, which was the object of our attack back of Don Sermuse. So they suspected the purpose of our little expedition. It lacked yet a minute or two of the time set for our dash at the balloon, and as I viewed the situation, it would not be wise for Coolidge and Chambers to take their departure from our formation until we had disposed of the advancing Fokkers from the west. Accordingly, I kept my altitude and set my machine towards the rear of the Stenay Fokkers, which I immediately observed were the red noses of the von Richthofen Circus. They were heading in at the 147 formation, which was still separated almost a mile away from our other spods. Lieutenant Wilbur White of New York was leading Number 147's pilots. He would have to bear the brunt of the Fokker's attack. Evidently, the Fokker leader scorned to take notice of me, as his scouts passed under me and plunged ahead towards White's formation. I let them pass, dipped over sharply, and with accumulated speed bore down upon the tail of the last man in the Fokker formation. It was an easy shot, and I could not have missed. I was agreeably surprised, however, to see that my first shots had set fire to the Hun's fuel tank and that the machine was doomed. I was almost equally gratified the next second to see the German pilot level off his blazing machine and with a sudden leap overboard into space let the Fokker slide safely away without him. Attached to his back and sides was a rope which immediately pulled a dainty parachute from the bottom of his seat. 
The umbrella opened within a fifty-foot drop, and settled him gradually to earth within his own lines. I was sorry I had no time to watch his spectacular descent. I truly wished him all the luck in the world. It is not a pleasure to see a burning aeroplane descending to earth, bearing with it a human being who is being tortured to death. Not unmixed with my relief in witnessing his safe jump was the wonder as to why the Huns had all these humane contrivances, and why our own country could not at least copy them to save American pilots from being burned to a crisp. I turned from this extraordinary spectacle in mid-air to witness another which in all my life at the front I have never seen equaled in horror and awfulness. The picture of it has haunted my dreams during many nights since. Upon seeing that my man was hit, I had immediately turned up to regain my superiority in height over the other Huns. Now as I came about and saw the German pilot leap overboard with his parachute, I saw that a general fight was on between the remaining ten Fokkers and the eight Spods of 147 Squadron. The Fokker leader had taken on the rear Spod in White's formation when White turned and saw him coming. Like a flash, White zoomed up in a half turn, executed a renversement, and came back at the Hun leader to protect his pilot from a certain death. White was one of the finest pilots and best air fighters in our group. He had won seven victories in combat. His pilots loved him and considered him a great leader, which he most assuredly was. White's maneuver occupied but an instant. He came out of his swoop and made a direct plunge for the enemy machine, which was just getting in line on the rear spod's tail. Without firing a shot, the heroic White rammed the Fokker head-on while the two machines were approaching each other at the rate of 250 miles per hour. It was a horrible yet thrilling sight. The two machines actually telescoped each other, so violent was the impact. Wings went through wings, and at first glance both the Fokker and Spod seemed to disintegrate. Fragments filled the air for a moment, then the two broken fuselages, bound together by the terrific collision, fell swiftly down and landed in one heap on the bank of the Meuse. For sheer nerve and bravery I believe this heroic feat was never surpassed. No national honor too great could compensate the family of Lieutenant White for this sacrifice for his comrade pilot and his unparalleled example of heroism to his squadron. For the most pitiable feature of Lieutenant White's self-sacrifice was the fact that this was his last flight over the lines before he was to leave for the United States on a visit to his wife and two small children. Not many pilots enter the service with loved ones so close to them. This extraordinary disaster ended the day's fighting for the Hun airmen. No doubt they valued their own leader as much as we did Lieutenant White, or perhaps they got a severe attack of wind up at witnessing the new method of American attack. At any rate, they withdrew, and we immediately turned our attention to the fight which was now in progress between the spods of 27 Squadron at our right and the Hun formation from Metz. It looked like a famous dogfight. As I came about and headed for the mix-up, I glanced below me at Don and was amazed to see one of our spods peeking upon the nested balloon through a hurricane of flaming projectiles. A flaming onion had pierced his wings, and they were now ablaze. To add to his predicament, a Hun machine was behind his tail, firing as he dived. I diverted my course and started down to his rescue, but it was too late. The fire in his wings was fanned by the wind and made such progress that he was compelled to land in German territory, not far from the sight of the balloon. In the meantime, other things were happening so rapidly that I had little opportunity to look about me. For even as I started down to help this balloon strafer, I saw another spod passing me with two Fokkers on his tail, filling his fuselage with tracer bullets as the procession went by. A first glance had identified the occupant of the spod as my old protege, the famous Jimmy Meisner. For the third time since we had been flying together, Providence had sent me along just in the nick of time to get Jimmy out of trouble. Twice before, on the old Newport, Jimmy had torn off his wings in too sudden a flip, and his unscrupulous antagonists had been about to murder him as he wobbled along when I happened by. Now, after a four-months interlude, Jimmy comes sailing by again, smiling and good-natured as ever, with two ugly brutes on his tail, trying their best to execute him. I quickly tacked onto the procession, settling my sights into the rear machine and letting go a long burst as I came within range. The Hun fell off and dropped down out of control, the other Fokker immediately pulling away and diving steeply for home and safety. Two other Fokkers fell in that dogfight, neither of which I happened to see. Both Coolidge and Chambers 
though they had been cheated of their balloon, brought down a Fokker apiece, which victories were later confirmed. The spot which had dropped down into German hands after being set afire by the flaming onions belonged to Lieutenant Brotherton, like White and Meisner, a member of the 147th Squadron. Four more victories were thus added to 94 score by this afternoon's work. We did not get the balloons, but we had done the best we could. I was never in favor of attacking observation balloons in full daylight, and this day's experience, the aroused suspicions of the observers, the pulling down of the balloon as strong aeroplane assistance at the same time arrived, and the fate of Lieutenant Brotherton, who had tried unsuccessfully to pass through the defensive barrage, is a fair illustration, I believe, of the difficulties attending such daylight strafings. Just at dawn, or just at dusk, is the ideal time for surprising the Drachen. Our captured Hanover machine, it will be recalled, had been brought back to our aerodrome, and by now was in good condition to fly. We left the Hun Maltese Cross and all their markings exactly as we found them, and after telephoning about to the various American aerodromes in our vicinity, that they must not practice target shooting at a certain Hanover aeroplane, that they might encounter while wandering over our part of the country, we took the machine up to see how it flew. The Hanover was a staunch, heavy craft, and had a speed of about one hundred miles an hour when two men, a pilot and an observer, were carried. She handled well and was able to slow down to a very comfortable speed at landing. Many of us took her up for a short flip and landed again without accident. Then it became a popular custom to let some pilot get aloft in her, and as he began to clear the ground, half a dozen of us in spots would rise after him and practice peeking down as if in an attack. The Hanover pilot would twist and turn and endeavor to do his best to outmaneuver the encircling spots. Of course, the lighter fighting machines always had the best of these mock battles, but the experience was good for all of us, both in estimating the extent of the maneuverability of the enemy two-seaters and in the testing of our relative speeds and climbings. While engaged in one of these mock combats over our field one afternoon, we came down to find Captain Cooper, the official movie picture expert, standing below watching us. He had his camera with him and had been attempting to grind out some movie films while we were flying overhead. He spent the night with us, and after some planning of the scenario, we decided to take him up in the rear seat of a Liberty airplane and let him catch with his camera a real movie of an airplane combat in midair. All the details were carefully arranged. We gathered next morning on the field, put him in the rear seat of the Liberty, and helped him strap in his camera so that the pressure of the wind would not carry it overboard. Jimmy Meisner was to be his pilot. Jimmy climbed in the front seat, warmed up his motor, and when everything was ready and we other actors were sitting in our seats waiting for him to get away, Jimmy gave the signal, opened up his motor, and began to taxi over the grass. Several hundred feet down the field he turned back, facing the wind, which was blowing from the west. Here he prepared for his real takeoff. His machine rushed along with ever-quickening speed until the tail lifted, the wheels next skimmed the ground, and the Liberty rose gradually into the air. Just as they approached the road which skirts the west side of the aerodrome, the Liberty's engine stopped. A line of wires ran along the roadside some fifteen feet above ground. Jimmy saw them and attempted to zoom over them, but in vain. The Liberty crashed full in the middle of the highway, bounded up a dozen feet, and after a half somersault, stuck her nose in the ground on the other side of the road and came to a rest. We hurried over, expecting to find the occupants badly injured, as the Liberty herself appeared to be a total wreck. But out stepped Jimmy and Captain Cooper, neither of them the worse for their experience. And to complete our surprise, the camera, although covered with the debris of the machine, was quite unhurt. That ended our little movie show for this day. We had no other two-seater machine on hand. But we were delighted to find that Captain Cooper, in spite of his narrow escape, was quite determined to go through with the show. So we went to the supply station for another machine, and again put the captain up for the night while awaiting its coming. Next day, October 19th, I was directed to appear before General Patrick at Suili to receive the American decoration, the Distinguished Service Cross, with four oak leaves. These oak leaves represent the number of citations in Army orders that the wearer of a decoration has received. The usual formalities, which I have already described, attended the ceremony. Over twenty pilots of the American Air Service were presented with the DSC by General Patrick, after which the military band played the national anthem while we all stood at attention. I could not help thinking of the absent pilots 
whose names were being read out but who did not answer and for whom decorations were waiting for deeds of heroism that had ended with their death there was white for whom the whole group mourned what a puny recognition was a simple ribbon for heroism such as his there was luke the most intrepid air fighter that ever sat in an airplane what possible honor could be given him by his country that would accord him the distinction he deserved one thing was certain the reputation of these great american airmen would live as long as the comrades who knew them survived perhaps none of us would ever live to see our homeland again i glanced down the line of honor men who were standing immobile in their tracks listening to the last notes of the star-spangled banner who will be the next to go i wondered knowing only too well that with every fresh honor that was conferred came a corresponding degree of responsibility and obligation to continue to serve comrade and country so long as life endured chapter thirty three an aeroplane movie show the new liberty duly arrived and after a brief rehearsal of our parts in the coming show we again had our machines run out on the field on the morning of october twenty first and took our stations in the line captain cooper was again placed in the rear seat of the liberty with jimmy meisner in the front seat acting as his pilot jimmy was to keep his machine as near the actors as possible always flying to the left side so that the photographer might face the show and keep his handle turning with the least possible difficulty reed chambers sat in the front seat of the captured hanover and piloted it he carried two guns which would fire only tracer and flaming bullets and with true movie instinct reed was prepared to do his utmost to imitate with two guns the roman candle effect of the latest four-gun effort of the huns whom he was supposed to represent in the rear seat of the hun machine sat thorn taylor the villain of the play he was dressed in villainous enough looking garments to deceive even the most particular hun he too had a gun one which swung on a tournel and which would emit a most fearsome amount of smoky and fiery projectiles when the climax of the action was reached as a clever piece de resistance thorn carried with him down out of sight of the camera until the proper time came a dummy bosch pilot stuffed with straw at the height of the tragedy thorn was supposed to duck himself down out of sight behind his cockpit and heave overboard the stuffed figure which would fall with outstretched arms and legs head over heels to earth this would portray the very acme of despair of the bosch aviators who it would be seen preferred to hurl themselves out to deliberate death rather than longer face the furious assaults of the dashing young american air fighters as to the latter i was supposed to be it in my old spa number one with the hat and the ring insignia plainly inscribed on the sides of the fuselage and the red white and blue markings along the wings and tail sufficiently glaring to prove to the most skeptical movie fan that this was indeed a genuine united states aeroplane i was to be jack the giant killer with an abundance of smoky and fiery stuff pouring from all my guns every time the monstrous hostile machine hove in sight a few films of a distant formation passing through the sky had been taken early in the game so as to delude the innocent public into the belief that i was going up to demolish the whole caravan with my one resistless machine a series of falls and vries would put the one hanover out of the fighting enough times to account for a whole formation of them then as the last desperate encounter took place thorn taylor after shooting all his spectacular ammunition well over my head would force the dummy to commit suicide rather than longer endure the suspense of waiting it was a clever plot the whole aerodrome was in raptures over the idea and everyone left off work to gather on the field to witness the contest i doubt if the later performances will ever have a more expectant more interested or so large an audience jimmy and his camera operator got away safely this time and right behind them the comedian and tragedians of the show winged their way arriving at two thousand feet over the field we pulled up our belts and began the performance it was necessary to keep an eye on the camera so as not to get out of its beam while pulling off our most priceless stunts and at the same time we had to be a little careful as to the direction in which our bullets were going captain cooper was thrusting his head out into the wind stream manfully trying to keep my swifter moving machine always within the eye of his camera as i came up under the hanover airplane's tail i would let off a terrific stream of flaming projectiles which are perfectly visible to the naked eye and certainly ought to be caught by a camera even in the daytime thorn shot as lustily under me and over me as i approached 
and even Reed's front guns were spitting death in a continuous stream at the imaginary enemy planes ahead of him. Over and over we repeated the performance, the Hanover dying a dozen deaths in as many minutes. At last, our movie ammunition beginning to near exhaustion, it became necessary to stage a big hit that denoted the climax of the play. Coming about above the Hanover, while Captain Cooper was grinding industriously away, not over twenty feet from its side, I came down in a swift peak, made a zoom and a renversement on the opposite side of the Hanover, and kicking my rudder over, came back directly at the enemy, full into the gaping lens of the camera. Firing my last rounds of ammunition as I approached, I saw them go safely over the tops of both machines. As I drew in to the closest possible distance that remained safe for such a maneuver, I threw my spot up into a zoom, passed over the vanquished Bosch, and came back in a loop somewhere near my original position. As I glanced at the Hanover, I saw that she was doomed. A quantity of lamp black, released by the crafty tailor, was drifting windward, indicating that something seriously wrong had occurred with the enemy machine. Such a dense cloud of smoke would satisfy the dullest intellect that he must soon begin to suspect fire. And ha! There she comes. I knew she was a fire. Sure enough, several bright landing flares suddenly ignited under the Hanover's wings, throwing a bright gleam earthwards, but prevented from injuring the wings themselves by the tin surfaces above them. Finding longer existence on such a burning deck utterly unendurable, the poor dummy gathered himself together in the arms of the stalwart tailor, and with one tremendous leap he departed the blazing furnace forever. While Taylor kept himself resolutely hidden below decks, Chambers, throwing out the last of his sack of lamp black, lifted over onto the side the doomed machine and gave a good exhibition of the falling leaf. Down, down it drifted, the daring photographer leaning far out of his cage to catch the last expiring gasps of the stricken Hanover, the last of the wicked formation of hostile machines that had dared to cross our frontiers early in the picture. And then, just as he was prepared to flash on the good night sign and entertain the departing audience with views of the best line of corsets to be had at reasonable prices at Mo Levy's Emporium, just then the real climax of the play did appear. We had necessarily wandered some little distance away from the vicinity of our aerodrome while firing genuine flaming bullets over each other, so that the falling missiles would not cause any injuries to the property or persons below. Paying little attention as to just where we were flying, so long as open country was below us, we had not noticed that we were some miles south and west of our starting place, and almost immediately over the edge of a French aerodrome. Suddenly a puff of real archy smoke in the vicinity of the Hanover told me that some enthusiastic outsider was volunteering his services in behalf of our little entertainment. Another and another shell burst before I could reverse my direction and get started to place my spot close to the black machine wearing the iron cross of the Kaiser. Reed Chambers took in the situation at a glance. He pointed down the Hanover's nose and began at once to descend for a landing on the French aerodrome below us. At the same moment, several French brigades left the field and began climbing up to assist me in my dangerous task of demolishing the Hanover. Diving down to intervene between them before any more shooting was done, I succeeded in satisfying the Frenchman that I had the affair well in hand and that the Hanover was coming down to surrender. Without further incident, we all landed and got out of our machines. The French pilots, their mechanics and poilus gathered about in a curious body while I laughingly hurried over to the side of Reed's machine and explained to the assembly the meaning of this strange performance. They all laughed heartily over their mistake, all except Reed and Thorn Taylor of the Hanover crew, who, from the expressions on their faces, seemed to admit that the joke was on them. Getting away again, the Hanover flew home under my protection. After it had landed, I climbed up through the clouds where Jimmy and the movie man were still waiting for me. There I stunted for a while in front of the camera, giving some excellent views of an aeroplane bursting through the clouds and some close-ups of all the aerial tumbling that a spot is capable of performing. Next day, Captain Cooper departed with his films for Paris, where he expected to turn them over to the American authorities and, if permitted, take a copy of them for public exhibition in Paris and the United States. A day or two after Christmas, on my way through Paris to New York, I learned that these pictures had turned out very well and would soon be shown in the movie palaces of the cities of America. The captured Hanover was flown into the American station at Orly, near Paris, a few days after the armistice was signed, and from there was shipped to America to be placed upon exhibition. Major Hartney and Lawrence L. Driggs of New York, who were visiting us at the time, 
flew in it from Verdun to Paris in a little less than an hour and a half. One captured Fokker machine and an escort of two Sopwith camels and one Spad accompanied them, for the enemy machine still carried the war markings of the German air service, and inquisitive Frenchmen along the way might be tempted to try to capture them a second time. So far as I know, these were the only two enemy airplanes captured by the American forces during the war. The Fokker came down upon our field at Verdun just a day or two before the end of hostilities, and was turned over to 95 Squadron as their capture, since they operated this field. The pilot had given himself up, saying he thought he was landing upon his own aerodrome at Metz. He had become lost in the fog, and as the two aerodromes are similarly situated along the edge of a river's course, his mistake was quite probable. Another two-seater, a Halberstadt machine, came down upon the American field at the supply station at colombay le bel under similar circumstances a few days before the armistice was signed. But in this case, the capture was a deliberate surrender. The two occupants climbed out of the machine and in pure New York patois informed the startled mechanics that they wished to make a bargain with them. They were, it transpired, two Yiddish gentlemen of German extraction, who for some years had been in business in New York. The war caught them in Germany, and they were perforce thrust into the service of what had once been their mother country. After many vicissitudes, they both entered aviation, seeking for the opportunity of flying over the lines and giving themselves up. Now a chance had arrived. Both of them getting permission to cross the lines in the same machine, they made straight for our headquarters at colombay la Belle, and now offered a perfectly good machine valued at not less than ten thousand dollars in exchange for their freedom and a pass back to harlem it was an attractive offer but since they were already in our custody as prisoners and the machine was regarded as a capture their conditions were respectfully declined the halberstadt was likewise later sent to orly and thence to america with the fokker and hanover which had been taken in by ninety four and ninety five squadrons the following afternoon i escaped assassination by four red-nosed fokkers by the narrowest margin ever vouchsafed to a pilot, and at the end of the combat flew safely home with my twenty-first and twenty-second victories to my credit. Curiously enough, I had gone out over the lines alone that day with a craving desire to get a thrill. I had become fed up with a continuation of eventless flights. Saying nothing to any of my fellows at the aerodrome, I went off alone with an idea of shooting down a balloon that I thought might be hanging just north of Montfaucon. While I did not get a shot at the balloon, I got all the thrill I needed for several days to come. It was about 5.30 in the afternoon when I ordered out my machine and set off for Montfaucon. As I neared the Meuse Valley, I found the whole vicinity was covered with a thick haze. So thick, in fact, that the Germans had hauled down all their observation balloons. There was nothing a mile away that could be observed until another day dawned. Over to the south, the sky was clearer. Our own balloons were still up but no enemy airplanes would be likely to come over our front again so late in the evening. While I was reflecting thus sadly, a bright blaze struck my eye from the direction of our nearest balloon. I headed around towards this spot in the shortest possible space of time. There could be but one explanation for such a blaze. A late roving Hun must have just crossed the lines and made a successful attack upon our balloon over Exermont. He ought to be an easy victim, I told myself, as soon as he should start to cross back into Germany, since I was on his direct road to the nearest point in his lines. He was now coming my way. Though I could not see him, I did see the bursting archie shells following his course northward. He must pass considerably under me, and no doubt would be quite alone. Just then a series of zipping streams of fire flashed by my face and through my fuselage and wings. I divined, rather than saw, what this was without looking around. Two or perhaps more than two enemy machines, were peeking on me from above. Utterly absorbed in planning what I should do to catch the other fellow, I had been perfectly blind to my own surroundings. The Hun balloon strafer had a protective formation waiting for him. They had seen me come over, and had doubtless been stalking me for many minutes without my knowing it. These thoughts flashed through my mind as I almost automatically zoomed up and did a climbing chandelle to escape the tracer bullets directed at me. I did not even stop to look at the position of my assailants. Knowing they were above, I concluded instantly that they had prepared for my diving away from them, and that therefore that would be the best thing for me to avoid. I fortunately had reasoned correctly. As I sped upwards, two red-nosed Fokkers, my old friends of the von Richthofen Circus, 
sped down and passed me. But even before I had time enough to congratulate myself upon my sagacity, I discovered that only half of them had passed me. Two more Fokkers had remained above on the chance that I might refuse to adopt a plan they had determined upon for me. One glimpse of the skillful contortions of these two upper Fokkers showed me that I was in for the fight of my life. I lost all interest in the progress or existence of the balloon strafer that had destroyed one of our balloons under my very nose. My one dearest desire was to get away off by myself, where thrills were never mentioned and were quite impossible to get. The masterly way in which the Fokkers met and even anticipated every movement I made assured me that I had four very experienced pilots with whom to deal. Zigzagging and side-slipping helped me not one whit, and I felt that I was getting a wind-up that would only sap my coolness and soon make me the easy prey of these four extremely confident Huns. The two machines that had first attacked me impudently remained below me in such a position that they invited my attack, while also preventing my escape in their direction. I made up my mind to start something before it was too late. Even though it meant getting into trouble, I decided that it would be better than waiting around for them to operate upon me, as they had no doubt been practicing in so many rehearsals. Noting a favorable opening for an attack on the nearest man below me, I suddenly tipped over at him and went hurtling down with all my speed, shooting from both guns. I had aimed ahead of him, instead of directly at him, to compel him either to pass ahead through the path of my bullets, or else dip down his nose or fall over onto his wing, in either case providing me with a fair target before he could get far away. He either preferred the former course or else did not see my bullets until it was too late. He ran straight through my line of fire, and he left it with a gush of flame issuing from his fuel tank. I fully believe that several bullets passed through the pilot's body as well. Considerably bucked up with this success, I did not seize this opportunity to escape, but executed blindly a sudden loop and renversement, under the strongest impression that my two enemies above would certainly be close onto my tail and preparing to shoot. Again, I had guessed correctly, for not only were they in just the position I expected to find them, and just where I myself would have been were I in their places, but they were also startled out of their senses over my sudden and unexpected assault upon their comrade. It is never an encouraging sight to see one comrade's machine falling in flames. It is sufficient to make the stoutest heart quail unless one is hemmed in and is fighting for his very life. But however that may be, my three neighbors did not turn to continue the combat with me, nor did they even pause for an instant to threaten my pursuit. All three continued their headlong dive for Germany with a faster and heavier spot machine following them, and gaining on them every second. My blood was up, and I considered that I had been badly treated by the red-nosed Bosch. I was three miles inside their lines. Other enemy machines might very easily be about. I had no time to look about to see, and I had just escaped from the very worst trap into which I had ever fallen. Yet I could not resist the mad impulse of paying back the three Huns for the scare they had so recently given me. Though the Spod is faster than the Fokker, the fleeing Huns had a slight start over me, and I did not immediately overtake them. One of the three gradually fell back behind the others. The ground was getting nearer and nearer, and it was growing very much darker as we approached the earth's surface. At about one thousand feet above ground, I decided the nearest Fokker was within my range. I opened fire, following his gyrations as he maneuvered to avoid my ever-nearing stream of lead. After letting go at him some two hundred bullets, his machine dropped out of control, and I ceased firing. His two companions had never slackened their pace, and were now well out of sight in the shadows. I watched my latest antagonist flutter down and finally crash, and then awoke to the fact that I was being fired at by hundreds of guns from the ground. The gunners and riflemen were so near to me that I could distinctly see their guns pointed in my direction. I had dropped down to within a hundred yards of earth. All the way back to the lines I was followed by machine-gun bullets and some archie. Absolutely untouched, I continued on to my field, where I put in my claim for two enemy Fokkers, and after seeing to the wounds of my faithful Spod, walked over to the ninety-four mess for supper. Chapter 34 An Overzealous Ally War flying is much like other business. One gets accustomed to all the incidents that attend its daily routine, its risks, its thrills, its dangers, its good and bad fortune. A strange sort of fatalism fastens to the mind of an aviator who continues to run the gauntlet of Archie. He flies through bursting shells without trying to dodge them, with indeed little thought of their menace. 
If a bullet or shell has his name written on it, there is no use trying to avoid contact with it. If it has not, why worry? To score a fatal hit, these invisible missiles of death have a great space to fill when a small airplane and a still smaller pilot are at a height of ten or twelve thousand feet above earth. Even when flying through the defensive fire of a balloon battery at two or three hundred feet elevation, or when cruising along the trenches but fifty feet above the rifles and machine guns of the enemy, we learn to disdain the furious fire that was turned upon our swift flying planes. Experience had taught us that the non-flying sharpshooter is woefully ignorant of the rapidity with which we pass his aim when we are traveling at the rate of two miles a minute, exactly 176 feet each second. It requires a second or more for him to steady his aim. How many riflemen can compute the exact point 176 feet ahead of their gun muzzle where the bullet and the pilot's head must meet in order to bring down the prize? Not one. Occasional hits are made at random, but the percentage is ridiculously low. When tracer bullets are fired at one's aeroplane, it is amusing to see how far behind the tail of the machine the streams of bullets are passing. When hundreds of Archie shells are bursting about one's vicinity, one of the flying fragments may, of course, happen to take the path that coincides with that of the pilot. Upon this problem, no scientist would dare to assume a position of authoritative knowledge as to the chances or percentages of possible hits. To the pilot who has actually experienced these daily strafings by Archie, the whole danger resolves itself into a question as to whether or not he will permit his imagination to terrorize him into fleeing away from so appalling but so futile a menace. In other words, he knows that the actual danger is almost nil. If a flying fragment of shrapnel happens to strike him, it is bad luck. There is no way to avoid it. A hundred to one, no hits will be received. Thus comes the fatalism that saves the experienced airman from worry. On Sunday, October 27th, only a fortnight before the end of the war, Hamilton Coolidge, one of the best pilots and most respected men in the American Air Service, met an annihilating death from a direct hit by an Archie shell in full flight. The shell had not yet burst when it struck the spot in which Coolidge was sitting. The aeroplane was moving forward at its usual fast speed when the mounting shell, probably traveling at the speed of 3,000 feet per second, struck squarely under the center of the aeroplane's engine. Poor Coolidge must have been killed instantly. The spod flew into fragments, and the unfortunate pilot dropped like a stone to the ground. Coolidge was one of the top score aces of 94 Squadron, and one of the most popular men in the service. A graduate of Groton, and later of Harvard, he possessed all the qualifications of leadership, and a brilliant career in any profession he might have chosen to adopt. In his work at the front, he never shirked and never complained. The loss of Lieutenant Hamilton Coolidge was one of the severest that we had been called upon to suffer. It was beginning to be a matter of constant conjecture among us as to just what day Germany would cave in and surrender. The collapse of Austria and the constant and obvious weakening of the Hun troops opposite our sector were well known to us. Hence it seemed doubly bitter that Ham Coolidge should meet death now, just as the end of the war was at hand. Especially tragic was it to all of us who knew Coolidge's fighting ability that he should be the one airman who should meet his end in this incredible manner. More than one pilot bitterly remarked that no German airman could down Ham Coolidge, so they had to kill him by a miracle. And miracle it was, for no other American pilot but one or two other aviators during the whole course of the war were shot down from on high by an Archie in full flight. The shell had Hamilton's name written on it, and there was no escape. Coolidge, with his usual intrepidity, was hurrying into the assistance of a formation of American bombing machines which, after dropping their eggs on the enemy town of Grand Pre, as they started home, were in turn attacked by a large number of swifter-flying Fokker machines. The Archie shells were directed at the bombers and not at the spod of Ham Coolidge. After having scornfully passed through hundreds of barrages which were aimed at him, our unlucky ace had collided with a shell not at all intended for him. Although I did not see this ghastly accident to poor Coolidge, I was in the midst of the same barrage of Archie on the other side of Grand Pre at the same time. The bombing machines above mentioned had not gained their objective without considerable fighting all the way over the lines. Thousands and thousands of German troops had been unloaded from trains during the previous night and were now hidden in Grand Pre and its neighborhood. 
the enemy fighting machines were out in force to defend this spot against bombing planes until these troops had an opportunity for moving and scattering themselves along their front. From every side, Fokkers were peeking upon the clumsy Liberty machines which, with their criminally constructed fuel tanks, offered so easy a target to the incendiary bullets of the enemy that their unfortunate pilots called this boasted achievement of our aviation department their flaming coffins. During that one brief fight over Grand Pre, I saw three of these crude machines go down in flames, an American pilot and an American gunner in each flaming coffin, dying this frightful and needless death. During the combats which followed, I again succeeded in bringing down two of the red-nosed Fokkers. The first victim was on my tail when I first noticed him. With one backward loop, I had reversed our positions and had my nose on his tail. One short burst from both my guns, and he tumbled down through space to crash a few miles within the German lines. The second combat occurred just a few minutes later. The last of the Liberty bombing machines had passed over the lines, or had crashed in flames, and I thought the day's work was over, when I noticed something going on to the east of me in the region of Bonfil. I began climbing and speeding forward to get a look at this performance, when to my surprise I discerned that one of the Liberty machines had been left behind and was in very evident distress. Fortunately, there was but a single enemy Fokker on his tail. The Yankee pilot was kicking his machine about, and the gunner at the rear was managing to keep his enemy at bay, when, at favorable elevation above them both, I found an opportunity to peek down and catch the Fokker, unaware of my approach. The Liberty motor, I discovered, was almost dud. It had either been struck by a bullet, or had developed some interior trouble of its own. The pilot had all he could do to maintain headway, and avoid the maneuvers of his enemy. Each time he banked the Liberty, it fell downwards two or three hundred feet. The Fokker had only to worry him enough, and the American machine must drop into German territory a captive. As I began firing, the German pilot, who had been so intent upon the capture of his prize that he had forgotten to watch his rear, zoomed suddenly up to let me pass under him. But that was too old a dodge to entrap me. I began a similar zoom just a fraction of a second before he started his, and I was the first to come out, on top. As I again prepared to open fire, I saw a curious sight. The Fokker, with a red nose, had not been able to complete his loop. He had stalled just at the moment he was upright on his tail, and in this position he was now hanging. And more extraordinary still, his engine had stalled and his propeller was standing absolutely still. I could see the color and laminations of the wood, so close had I approached to my helpless victim. On March 10, 1918, there is the following entry in my flight diary. Resolve today that hereafter I will never shoot at a Hun who is at a disadvantage, regardless of what he would do if he were in my position. Just what episode influenced me to adopt that principle, and even to enter it into my diary, I have forgotten. That was very early in my fighting days, and I had then but a few combats in air. But with American flyers the war had always been more or less a sporting proposition, and the desire for fair play, the anger it always arouses in a true American to see any violation of fair play, prevents a sportsman from looking at the matter in any other light, even though it be a case of life or death. However that may be, I do not recall a single violation of this principle by any American aviator that I should care to call my friend. My Fokker enemy was now in a very ludicrous position. Of course, he could not continue hanging on there forever with his nose pointing upwards, his tail to the ground, and his propeller dead. He began falling with a tail slip. He was wondering why I didn't finish him, or at least didn't begin some attack, so that he might know which way to head his last dive. We were over ten thousand feet above ground, and looking down I saw that we were still two or three miles within German lines. Naturally enough, the pilot will turn his nose homeward when he falls far enough to get headway for a glide. Accordingly, I kept control of the situation by heading him off and firing a few shots to show him that I did not mean to let him escape. Now the tables are turned. Instead of my Fokker friend nursing homewards to Germany a captured and crippled American machine, I am endeavoring to impress upon him that an American is desirous of escorting back to the American lines a slightly crippled but very famous Fokker with a red nose. What a triumphant entry I will make with one of Baron von Richthofen's celebrated fighting planes. I picture the flights over our field I will make with my prize tomorrow. The Bosch pilot was satisfied that I had the upper hand, and he was gliding along in the proper direction with admirable docility. We should clear the lines by at least five miles. 
I could steer him from behind by firing a few bursts ahead, which had the effect of pushing him over in the direction I wanted him to go. It was as simple as driving a tame horse to the creek. Over the lines we passed, the Fokker gliding steadily along ahead of me, no other airplanes in the sky. Under the impression that I knew this country better than my companion might know it, I compelled him to steer for the Exermont field, which lay just about four miles behind our front-line trench. He willingly complied, immediately heading in the desired direction, and apparently quite content to play fair with me and spare me his Fokker, since I had spared him his life. Of course, I was fully aware that he might attempt to set fire to his machine as soon as he touched the ground. I should have done the same had I been in his place. But I did not intend that he should have this opportunity. With his dead engine, he could not change his course once he began to settle to the ground. I would put myself immediately behind him, and if he attempted to do any injury to his aeroplane, I would shoot him on the spot. With this plan in mind, I left him a moment when he was making his last circle over the field at about three hundred feet altitude, and withdrew so that I might turn and land my machine in such a position that he must come to a stop just ahead of me. And then I received one of the worst disappointments of my whole life. A spawned aeroplane suddenly appeared from out of the sky just as I turned away from my convoy. The unknown idiot in the spod began firing a long burst into my helpless captive. I did not suspect his presence until I heard him firing. Whipping madly back, I peeked down and intervened between the malignant spod and my protégé, even firing a short burst to warn the intruder away. The latter understood me well enough, for he left us and did not return. The marks on his machine were not familiar to me, and to this day I do not know whether this interfering person was an American or a Frenchman. But whichever he was, he had absolutely ruined all my chances of a capture. The Fokker pilot had been at the outside of his turn when this unexpected attack was received. The spot had headed him off, compelling him to turn to the right instead of to the left in the direction of the field. Now he was so low that it would be suicide to attempt to make the field. Trees and rough ground were beneath him, and the only safe course would be to pancake as flatly as possible in the rough, open ground directly ahead of him. All my hopes vanished as I saw the nature of his landing place. I circled above him until after the crash. He had overshot his mark a little and ended up against the edge of the opposite bit of woods. My red-nosed prize was scattered in pieces over the ground. To my genuine joy I saw the pilot disentangle himself from the wreckage and walk out upon the ground. An officer on horseback and some of our doughboys were advancing on the run to make him a prisoner. He waved his thanks to me as I passed overhead, and I waved back in the most friendly manner. Inwardly I was furious with him, myself, and most especially with the wretched pilot of the unknown spod. So nearly had I succeeded in capturing intact a most valuable Fokker from Germany's most famous squadron. So near, and yet... Returning home, I was somewhat mollified to learn that my belated commission as captain had just arrived. I had been acting captain for several weeks, and had been told that my commission was on its way, but these rumors often proved unfounded. But it had arrived at last, and I would this night add an extra bar to each shoulder. And then I was told of the awful loss of poor Hamilton Coolidge, surviving six months of very active flying over enemy's lines, fighting nearly a hundred combats, and escaping without a single wound while he brought down confirmed eight enemy airplanes. Our gallant comrade had been suddenly swept away by a catastrophe that appalled us to contemplate. Early next morning I secured a staff car and proceeded up to the front to find the spot where lay the last remains of my dear friend. We reached Montfaucon and turned northwest around the edge of the Argonne Forest, passing on the way the wreckage of my red-nosed Fokker just outside the town of Exermont. Arrived to within a mile of our own front line, sheltered all along the road by hanging curtains of burlap and moss, part of which had been left by the Huns, and partly our own concoction of camouflage, we were halted by an officer who told me we could move no further without coming under shell fire from the enemy guns. Abandoning the car at the roadside, we skirted the edge of the woods that adjoined the road and made our way on foot to the flatlands just across the Air River from the opposite town of Grand Pré and here in the bend of the air, almost in full sight of the enemy, we came upon the body of Captain Coolidge, a lieutenant in infantry who had seen the whole spectacle, and had marked down the spot where Ham's body had fallen, accompanied us, and it was through his very kind offices that we reached the exact spot without much searching. The chaplain of his regiment likewise accompanied us, and there, not sixty yards behind our front lines, 
we watched the men dig a grave. The chaplain administered the last sad rites. Amid the continuous whines of passing shells, we laid the poor mangled body of Captain Hamilton Coolidge in its last resting place. Over the grave was placed a cross, suitably engraved with his name, rank, and the date of his tragic death. A wreath of flowers was laid at the foot of the cross. Then, with uncovered head, I took a photograph of the grave, which later was sent back home to the family who mourned for one of the most gallant gentlemen who ever fought in France. Chapter 35 The End Draws Near October was a month of glorious successes for 94 Squadron, having brought us 39 victories with but five losses. For, besides Captain Coolidge and Lieutenant Nutt, the squadron had lost Lieutenant Saunders of Billings, Montana, shot down on the 22nd, went out after balloons with Cook and Jeffers. Cook, on this occasion, succeeded in setting fire to the balloon he was attacking, and Jeffers, turning upon the Fokker which had just sunk Saunders, shot him down in flames sixty seconds later. On the 29th, Lieutenant Garnsey of Grand Haven, Michigan, fell in our lines near Exermont, after having fought a brilliant combat against greatly superior numbers. Reed Chambers, after bringing down an enemy machine on the 22nd, which he attacked at the tail of a Fokker formation containing five aeroplanes, returned to the aerodrome in considerable pain from a sudden seizure of appendicitis, and next day was sent to the hospital, where he had the appendix removed. The squadron had developed eight aces, including Luffbury, Campbell, Coolidge, Meisner, and Chambers, all of whom were now absent, and Cook, Taylor, and myself who were left to carry on to the end of the war. Meisner was absent only in the sense that he was now in command of the 147th Squadron, and his victories were going to swell the score for his newly adopted squadron instead of our own. Many others were going strong at the end of October, and needed but the opportunity to fight their way up into the leading scores of the group. Rain and dud weather kept us on the ground much of the time, and when we did get away for brief patrols, we found the enemy machines were even more particular about flying in bad weather than we were. None put in an appearance, and we were forced to return empty-handed so far as fighting laurels were concerned. Our first night-flying squadron had been formed early in October, under the command of Captain Seth Lowe of New York, and had its hangars on our group aerodrome. This was not a squadron of bomb-carrying airplanes, but one with which to attack bombing machines of the enemy and prevent their reaching their intended targets over our lines. The night-flying airplanes were the English Sopwith Camels, a light, single-seater capable of extraordinary evolutions in the air, and able to land upon the ground in the darkness at a very low speed. The British had inaugurated this special defense against the Hun bombers in their raids upon London. Later, the same system was tried at the British front, with such success that over a score of German bombers were brought down in a single month by one squadron of night-flying camels. Of course, such a defense must have the cooperation, both of signaling and listening squads, to notify the night flyers as to just when and where an attack is threatened, and also the timely cooperation of the searchlight squads is essential to enable the airmen to pick up the enemy machines in the darkness, while at the same time blinding with a glare the eyes of the Hun pilots. Principally by reason of the lack of this cooperation, our camel squadron, though it made several sorties along the lines during the month of October, did not meet any enemy bombers and had no combats. Time and study of this problem would doubtless have made of the Squadron 185 a valuable defense to our sector of the front, including the cities of Nancy, Toul, and colombay le Bel, which were repeatedly visited at night by German Gothas. Bombs were getting heavier and more destructive. More and more machines were being devoted to this branch of aviation, now instead of the Germans monopolizing this terror-spreading game, the tables were turned, and the Allies dropped ten times the amount of bombs into German cities. Even the oldest residents were moving out of the beautiful cities of the Rhine. On the next to the last day of October, I won my twenty-fifth and twenty-sixth victories, which were the last that I was to see added to my score. Two others that I had previously brought down were never confirmed. After the deplorable death of Frank Luke, who had won eighteen victories in less than six weeks of active flying at the front. There were no other American air fighters who were rivaling me in my number of victories. But ever since I had been captain of the 94th Squadron, the spur of rivalry had been entirely supplanted in me by the necessity of illustrating to the pilots under my orders that I would ask them to do nothing that I myself would not do. 
so covetously did i guard this understanding with myself that i took my machine out frequently after the day's patrol was finished and spent another hour or two over the lines the obligations that must attend leadership were a constant thought to me greater confidence in my leadership was given me when i noticed that my pilots appreciated my activity and my reasons for it never did i permit any pilot in my squadron to exceed the number of hours flying over the lines that was credited to me in the flight sheets at the close of the war only reed chambers's record approached my own in number of hours spent in the air i allude to this fact because i am convinced after my six weeks experience as squadron commander that my obedience to this principle did much to account for the wholehearted and enthusiastic support the pilots of my squadron gave me and only by their loyalty and enthusiasm was their squadron to lead all the others at the front in number of victories and number of hours over enemy's lines with reed chambers's forced absence at the hospital the leadership of our first flight was put in charge of lieutenant k on october thirtieth i had been out on two patrols in the forenoon both of which had been without unusual incident or result when k left the field with his flight at three o'clock in the afternoon i decided to accompany him to observe his tactics as flight leader this formation composed of only four machines two of which were piloted by new men was to fly at only two thousand feet elevation and was to patrol the enemy's lines between grand pre and brioul i took my place considerably in their rear and perhaps one thousand feet above them in this position we reached brioul and made two round trips with them between our two towns without discovering any hostile airplanes as we turned west for the third trip however i noticed two lone fokkers coming out of germany at a low elevation from their maneuvers i decided that they were stalking lieutenant k's flight and were only waiting until they had placed themselves in a favorable position before beginning their attack i accordingly turned my own machine away into germany to get behind them still keeping my altitude and trusting that they would be too intent on the larger quarry to notice me i had hardly begun to turn back when i saw that they had set their machines in motion for their attack opening up myself i put down my nose and tried to overtake them but they had too great a start i saw that k had not seen them and in spite of the odds in our favor i feared for the two new men who were at the end of the formation and who must assuredly bear the first diving assault of the fokkers fortunately k saw them coming before they had reached firing range and he immediately turned his formation south in the direction of home cook is with k and those two will be able to defend the two youngsters if the fokkers really get to close quarters i thought to myself I could not hope to overtake them myself, anyway, if they continued back into France. So, after a little reflection, I stayed where I was, witnessing a daring attempt of the Fokkers to break up Case formation, which, nevertheless, was unsuccessful. Both Fokkers attacked the rear spod, which was piloted by Lieutenant Evett, one of our new men. Instead of trying to maneuver them off, he continued to fly straight ahead, affording them every opportunity in the world of correcting their aim and getting their bullets home evett discovered upon landing that one of his right struts was severed by their bullets after this one attack the fokkers turned back i was in the meantime flying deeper into germany keeping one eye upon the two enemy machines to discover in which direction they would cross the lines to reach their own side they seemed in no hurry to get back but continued westward heading towards grand pre very well that suited me perfectly i would make a great detour coming back out of germany immediately over grand pre with the hope that if they saw me they might believe me one of their own until we got to close quarters but before i reached grand pre i noticed them coming towards me i was then almost over the town of emmacor and quite a little distance within their lines they were very low and not more than a thousand feet above ground at most i was quite twice this height like lambs to the slaughter they came unsuspectingly on not half a mile to the east of me letting them pass i immediately dipped over swung around as i fell and opening up my motor peaked with all speed on the tail of the nearest fokker with less than twenty rounds all of which poured full into the centre of the fuselage i ceased firing and watched the fokker drop helplessly to earth as it began to revolve slowly i noticed for the first time that again i had outwitted a member of the von richthofen crowd the dying fokker wore an especially brilliant nosepiece of bright red as my first tracer bullets began to streak past the fokker his companion put down his nose and dived for the ground as he was well within his own territory i did not venture to follow him at this low altitude but at once began climbing to avoid the coming storm of archie and machine-gun fire little or none of this came my way however 
and I continued homeward, passing en route over the little village of Saint-Georges, which was then about two miles inside the enemy lines. And there, directly under my right wing, lay in its bed a German observation balloon just at the edge of the village. On a sudden impulse, I kicked over my rudder, pointed my nose at the huge target, and pulled the triggers. Both guns worked perfectly. I continued my sloping dive to within a hundred feet of the sleeping Drachen, firing up and down its whole length by slightly shifting the course of my aeroplane. Not a human being was in sight. Evidently the Huns thought that they were quite safe in this spot, since this balloon had not yet been run up, and its location could not be known to our side. I zoomed up and climbed a few hundred feet for another attack if it should be necessary, but as I balanced my machine and looked behind me, I saw the fire take effect. These flaming bullets sometimes require a long time to ignite the balloon fabric. Doubtless they travel too fast to ignite the pure gas, unmixed with air. The towering flames soon lit up the sky with a vivid glare, and, keeping it behind me, I speeded homeward, with many self-satisfied chuckles at my good fortune. But too much self-satisfaction always receives a jolt. I had not gone ten miles before I received the worst kind of a scare. It had become quite dark, and I was very near to the ground. Still some distance inside the German lines, for I had kept east in the hope that another Hun balloon might be left for my last rounds of ammunition, I thought of looking at my watch to see how late it really was. I had fuel for only two hours and ten minutes. A vague sort of premonition warned me that I had been overlooking something of importance in the past few minutes. One glance at my watch, and I realized exactly what had been weighing in the back of my mind. The time indicated that I had now been out exactly two hours and ten minutes. A real terror seized me for a moment. I was not up far enough above earth to glide for any distance when my motor stopped. Even as I banked over and turned southward, I wondered whether my motor would gasp and expire in the turning. I feared to climb, and I feared to stay low. I gazed over the sides of my office and tried to make out the nature of the landing ground below. Throttling down to the slowest possible speed to save fuel, I crept towards the lines. It was dark enough to see that suspicious heinies below were shooting at me on the chance that I might be an enemy. Glad I was to see those flashes receding farther and farther to my rear. I had passed the lines somewhere west of Verdun, and now must chance upon any open field I came to when the engine gave its last cough. Why didn't it stop? I wondered. It was now five or six minutes overdue. In miserable anticipation of the lot fate had in store for me, I struggled on, noting with additional gloom that the searchlight that should long ago be pointing out the way to my aerodrome had not been lighted. I could not be more than ten miles from home. Why couldn't those men attend to their business when pilots were known to be out? I took out my very pistol and fitted in a red light. That would notify them at home that I was in trouble and in a hurry to land. Just as I fired the second very light, I heard the motor begin its final sputtering. And then, just as I felt cold chills running up my back, the blessed landing lights flashed out, and I saw I was almost over the field. Forgetting all my recent joy, I made myself as wretched as possible the following few seconds in concluding that I could not by any possibility reach the smooth field. It seemed to work. The treatment. I had expatiated my sins of overconfidence and appeased the goddess of luck, for I cleared the road, landed with the wind, and struck the ground with a quiet thud less than a hundred feet from the entrance to 94's hangar, right side up, but I walked over to the mess with a chastened spirit. The following morning was rainy, and all the afternoon it continued to pour. Just before dusk we received orders to have our whole force over the lines at daybreak to protect an infantry advance from Grand Pré to Bouzancy. We all felt that we were to witness the last great attack of the war, and we were right. A heavy fog of the genuine Moose Valley variety prevented our planes leaving the ground until the middle of the forenoon. All the morning we heard the tremendous artillery duel at the north of us, and very impatiently waited for a clearing of the weather. That dull morning was somewhat relieved by a receipt of newspapers stating that Turkey had surrendered unconditionally, and that Austria was expected to follow suit the following day. Placing about a hundred of these journals in my plane, I set out for the lines with our patrol at 9.30 o'clock. Arrived over the front lines near the town of La Pelle, I flew at an altitude of only a hundred feet from the ground, and there I saw our doughboys, after the victorious advance of the morning, crouching in every available shell-hole and lying several deep in every depression, while looking forward for a snipe-shot at any enemy's head that came into view. Others were posted behind woods and buildings with bayonets fixed, waiting for the word to go forward. As I passed overhead, I threw overboard handfuls of morning papers to them 
and was amused to see how eagerly the doughboys ran out of their holes to pick them up. With utter disdain for the nearby Hun snipers, they exposed themselves gladly for the opportunity of getting the latest news from an airplane. I knew the news they would get would repay them for the momentary risk they ran. Dropping half my load there, I flew on over the Moselle Valley, where I distributed the remainder of the papers among the men in the front-line trenches along that sector. Returning then to the region of Bouzancy, I first caught sight of a huge supply depot burning. A closer view disclosed the fact that it was German, and German soldiers were still on the premises. They were destroying materials that they knew they would be unable to save. In other words, they were contemplating a fast retreat. A few dashes up and down the highways, leading to the north, quickly confirmed this impression. Every road was filled with lorries and retreating artillery. All were hurrying towards Longuillon and the German border. All the way up the Meuse, as far as Stenay, I found the same mad rush for the rear. Every road was filled with retreating heinies. They were going while the going was good, and their very gestures seemed to indicate for them it was indeed the fini de la guerre. I hurried home to make my report, which I felt certain would be welcome to those in authority. The following day I obtained permission to visit Paris on a three days' leave. For the first time since I had been in France, I found the streets of Paris illuminated at night, and gaiety unrestrained possessing the boulevards and cafés. With the Place de la Concorde and the Champs-Élysées crammed with captured German guns and German airplanes, with flags and bunting astream everywhere, it looked here, too, that people thought it was the fini de la guerre. I am told that Paris did not go raving mad until that unforgettable night of the signing of the armistice. But from the street scenes I saw there during those first days of November, while the Huns were in full retreat from the soil of France that had so long been polluted by their feet, it is difficult to imagine how any people could express greater happiness. Personally, I am glad that I was with my squadron instead of in Paris on the night the war ended. For great as were the sights there, none of them could have expressed to an aviator such a view of the sentiment and feeling of aviation over the termination of this game of killing as was exhibited at our own aerodrome on the night the official order, Cease Firing, came to us. Chapter 36 The Last Victory of the Great War Returning from Paris on November 5th, I found it still raining. Almost no flying had been possible along this sector since my departure. In fact, no patrol left our field until November 8th, the same day on which we caught by wireless the information that the Bosch delegates had crossed the lines between Audry and Chem on the La Chapelle Road to sign the armistice. Peace, then, was actually in sight. For weeks there had been a feeling in the air that the end of the war was near. To the aviators, who had been flying over the lines, and who had with their own eyes seen the continuous withdrawals of the Germans to the rear, there was no doubt but that the Huns had lost their immoderate love for fighting, and were sneaking homewards as fast as their legs would carry them. Such a certainty of victory should have operated to produce a desire to live and let live among men who were desirous of seeing the end of the war. That is, men who preferred to survive rather than run the risk of combat fighting now that the war was fairly over. But it was at this very period of my leadership of the 94th Squadron that I found my pilots most infatuated with fighting. They importuned me for permission to go out at times when a single glance at the fog and rain showed the foolishness of such a request. Not content with the collapse of the enemy forces, the pilots wanted to humiliate them further with flights deep within their country where they might strafe aeroplane hangars and retreating troops for the last time. It must be done at once, they feared, or it would be too late. On the ninth of November, Lieutenant DeWitt and Captain Fauntleroy came to me after lunch and begged me to go to the door of my hut and look at the weather with them. I laughed at them, but did as they requested. It was dark and windy outside, heavy low clouds driving across the sky, though for the moment no rain was falling. I took a good look around the heavens and came back to my room, the two officers following me. Here they cornered me and talked volubly for ten minutes, urging my permission to let them go over the lines and attack one last balloon, which they had heard was still swinging back of the Meuse. They overcame every objection of mine with such earnestness that finally, against my best judgment, I acquiesced and permitted them to go. At this moment, Major Kirby, who had just joined the 94 Squadron for a little experience in air fighting before taking command of a new group of squadrons that was being formed, and who as yet had never flown over the lines, stepped into the room and requested permission 
to join De Witt and Fauntleroy in their expedition. Lieutenant Cook would go along with him, he said, and they would hunt in pairs. If they didn't take this opportunity, the war might end overnight, and he would never have had a whack at an enemy plane. Full of misgivings at my own weakness, I walked out onto the field and watched the four pilots get away. I noted the time on my watch, noted that a heavy wind was blowing them away and would increase their difficulties in returning, blamed myself exceedingly that I had permitted them to influence me against my judgment. The next two hours were miserable ones for me. The weather grew steadily worse, rain fell, and the wind grew stronger. When darkness fell, shortly after four o'clock, I ordered all the lights turned on the field, and taking my seat at the mouth of our hangar, I anxiously waited for a glimpse of the homecoming spods. It was nearing the limit of their fuel supply, and another ten minutes must either bring some word from them, or I should know that by my orders four pilots had sacrificed themselves needlessly after hostilities had practically ceased. I believe that hour was the worst one I have ever endured. Night fell, and no airplanes appeared. The searchlights continued to throw their long fingers into the clouds, pointing the way home to any wandering scouts who might be lost in the storm. Foolish as it was to longer expect them, I could not order the lights extinguished, and they shone on all through the night. The next day was Sunday, and another decoration ceremony was scheduled to take place at our field at eleven o'clock. A number of pilots from other aerodromes were coming over to receive the Distinguished Service Cross from the hands of General Leger for bravery and heroic exploits over enemy lines. Several of our own group, including myself, were to be among the recipients. The band played, generals addressed us, and all the men stood at attention in front of our line of fighting planes while the dignified ceremony was performed. Two more palms were presented to me to be attached to my decoration. The army orders were read aloud, praising me for shooting down enemy airplanes. How bitter such compliments were to me that morning nobody ever suspected. Not a word had come from any one of my four pilots that I had sent over the lines the day before. No explanation but one was possible. All four had been forced to descend in enemy territory, crashed, killed, or captured. It little mattered so far as my culpability was concerned. In fact, a message had come in the night before that a spot had collided in air with a French two-seater near Beaumont late that afternoon. A hurried investigation by telephone disclosed the fact that no other spots were missing but our own thus filling me with woeful conjectures as to which one of my four pilots had thus been killed in our own lines. At the conclusion of the presentation of decorations, I walked back to the hangar and put on my coat, for it was a freezing day and we had been forced to stand for half an hour without movement in dress tunic and breeches. The field was so thick with fog that the photographers present could scarcely get light enough to snap the group of officers standing in line. No airplanes could possibly be out today, or I should have flown over to Beaumont at daybreak to ascertain which of my pilots had been killed there. I was invited to mess with 95 Squadron that noon, and I fear I did not make a merry guest. The compliments I received for my newly received decorations fell on deaf ears. As soon as I decently could get away, I made my adieus and walked back across the aerodrome. And about halfway across, I saw an airplane standing in the center of the field. I looked at it idly, wondering what idiot had tried to get away in such a fog. Suddenly I stopped dead in my tracks. The spod had a hat in the ring painted on its fuselage, and a large number three was painted just beyond it. Number three was Fauntleroy's machine. I fairly ran the rest of the way to my hangar, where I demanded of the mechanics what news they had heard about Captain Fauntleroy. I was informed that he had just landed and had reported that Lieutenant DeWitt had crashed last night inside our lines but would be back during the course of the day. And to cap this joyful climax to a day's misery, I was told five minutes later at group headquarters that Major Kirby had just telephoned in that he had shot down an enemy airplane across the Meuse this morning at ten o'clock, after which he had landed at an aerodrome near the front and would return to us when the fog lifted. It was a wild afternoon we had at 94 Mess upon receipt of this wonderful news. Cookie, too, was later heard from, he having experienced a rather more serious catastrophe the previous afternoon. He had attacked an observation balloon near Beaumont. The Hun defenses shot off one blade of his propeller, and he had barely made his way back across the lines when he was compelled to land in the shell holes which covered this area. He escaped on foot to the nearest American trench, and late Sunday afternoon reached our mess. Major Kirby's victory was quickly confirmed later inquiries disclosing the wonderful fact that this first remarkable victory of his was, in truth, 
the last airplane shot down in the Great War. Our old 94 squadron had won the first American victory over enemy airplanes when Alan Winslow and Douglas Campbell had dropped two biplane machines on the Toole Aerodrome. 94 squadron had been the first to fly over the lines and had completed more hours flying at the front than any other American organization. It had won more victories than any other, and now, for the last word, it had the credit of bringing down the last enemy airplane of the war. One can imagine the celebration with which 94 squadron would signalize the end of the war, what could Paris, or any other community in the whole world, offer in comparison? And the celebration came even before we had lost the zest of our present gratitude and emotion. The story of Major Kirby's sensational victory can be told in a paragraph. He had become lost the night before, and had landed on the first field he saw. Not realizing the importance of telephoning us of his safety, he took off early next morning to come home. This time he got lost in the fog which surrounded our district. When he again emerged into clear air, he found he was over Etang, a small town just north of Verdun, and there, flying almost alongside of his spot, was another airplane which a second glance informed him was an enemy Fokker. Both pilots were so surprised, for a moment, that they simply gazed at each other. The Fokker pilot recovered his senses first and began a dive towards earth. Major Kirby immediately peeked on his tail, followed him down to within fifty feet of the ground, firing all the way. The Fokker crashed head-on, and Kirby zoomed up just in time to avoid the same fate. With his usual modesty, Major Kirby insisted he had scared the pilot to his death. Thus ended the war in the air on the American front. While listening to these details that evening after mess, our spirits bubbling over with excitement and happiness, the telephone sounded and I stepped over and took it up, waving the room to silence. It was a message to bring my husky braves over across to the 95 mess to celebrate the beginning of a new era. I demanded of the speaker, it was Jack Mitchell, captain of the 95th, what he was talking about. Peace has been declared. No more fighting, he shouted. C'est la fini de la guerre. Without reply, I dropped the phone and turned around and faced the pilots of 94 squadron. Not a sound was heard. Every eye was upon me, but no one made a movement or drew a breath. It was one of those peculiar psychological moments when instinct tells everyone that something big is impending. In the midst of this uncanny silence, a sudden boom-boom of our Archie battery outside was heard. And then pandemonium broke loose. Shouting like mad, tumbling over one another in their excitement, the daring pilots of the Hat in the Ring squadron, sensing the truth, darted into trunks and kit bags, drew out revolvers, German Lugers, that some of them had found or bought as souvenirs from French poilus, very pistols, and shooting tools of all descriptions, and burst out of doors. There the sky over our old aerodrome, and indeed in every direction of the compass, was aglow and shivering with bursts of fire. Searchlights were madly cavorting across the heavens, paling to dimness the thousands of colored lights that shot up from every conceivable direction. Shrill yells pierced the darkness around us, punctuated with a fierce rat-tat-tat-tat-tat, of a score of machine guns, which now added their noise to the clamor. Roars of laughter and hysterical whoopings came to us from the men's quarters beside the hangars. Pistol shots were fired in salvos, filled and emptied again and again until the weapon became too hot to hold. At the corner of our hangar I encountered a group of my pilots rolling out tanks of gasoline. Instead of attempting the impossible task of trying to stop them, I helped them get it through the mud and struck the match myself and lighted it. A dancing ring of crazy lunatics joined hands and circled around the blazing pyre. Similar howling and revolving circuses surrounding several other burning tanks of good United States gasoline that would never more carry fighting aeroplanes over enemy lines. The stars were shining brightly overhead, and the day's mist was gone. But at times even the stars were hidden by the thousands of rockets that darted up over our heads and exploded with their soft plonks releasing very colored lights which floated softly through this epochal night until they withered away and died. Star shells, parachute flares, and streams of very lights continued to light our way through an aerodrome seemingly thronged with madmen. Everybody was laughing, drunk with the outgushing of their long pent-up emotions. I live through the war! I heard one whirling dervish of a pilot shouting to himself as he pirouetted alone in the center of a mud hole. Regardless of who heard the inmost secret of his soul, now that the war was over, he had retired off to one side to repeat this fact over and over to himself until he might make himself sure of its truth. Another pilot, this one an ace of 27 squadron, 
grasped me securely by the arm and shouted almost incredulously, "'We won't be shot at any more!' Without waiting for a reply, he hastened on to another friend and repeated this important bit of information, as though he were doubtful of a complete understanding on this trivial point. What sort of new world will this be without the excitement of danger in it? How queer it will be in the future to fly over the dead line of the silent muse, that significant boundary line that was marked by the archie shells, to warn the pilot of his entrance into danger. How can one enjoy life without this highly spiced sauce of danger? What else is there left to living now that the zest and excitement of fighting aeroplanes is gone? Thoughts such as these held me in trance for the moment, and were afterwards recalled to illustrate how tightly strung were the nerves of these boys of twenty, who had, for continuous months, been living on the very peaks of mental excitement. In the mess hall of Mitchell's squadron, we found gathered the entire officer personnel of the group. Orderlies were running back and forth, with cups brimming with hastily concocted punch, with which to drink to the success and personal appearance of every pilot in aviation. Songs were bellowed forth, accompanied by the crashing sounds from the Bosch piano, the proudest of ninety-five souvenirs, selected from an officer's mess of an abandoned German camp. Chairs and benches were pushed back to the walls, and soon the whole roomful was dancing, struggling, and whooping for joy to the imminent peril of the rather temporary walls and floor. Some unfortunate pilot fell, and in a trice everybody in the room was forming a pyramid on top of him. The appearance of the CEO of the group brought the living mass to its feet in a score of rousing cheers to the best CO in France. Major Hartney was hoisted upon the piano, while a hundred voices shouted, Speech! Speech! No sooner did he open his lips than a whirlwind of sound from outside made him pause and reduce the room to quiet, but only for an instant. It's the jazz band from old 147, yelled the pilots, and like a tumultuous waterfall, they poured en masse through a doorway that was only wide enough for one at a time. Whooping, shrieking, and singing, the victors of some four hundred odd combats with enemy airmen encircled the musicians from the enlisted men of 147 squadron. The clinging clay mud of France lay ankle deep around them. Within a minute, the dancing throng had with their hopping and skipping plowed it into an almost bottomless bog. Someone went down, dragging down with him the portly bass drummer. Upon this foundation, human forms in the spotless uniforms of the American Air Service piled themselves until the entire group lay prostrate in one huge pyramid of joyous aviators. It was later bitterly disputed as to who was and who was not at the very bottom of this historic monument, erected that night under the starry skies of France, to celebrate the extraordinary fact that we had lived through the war and were not to be shot at tomorrow. It was the fini de la guerre. It was the fini de aviation. It was to us, perhaps unconsciously, the end of that intimate relationship that since the beginning of the war had cemented together brothers in arms into a closer fraternity than is known to any other friendship in the whole world. When again will that pyramid of entwined comrades, interlacing together in one mass boys from every state in our union, when again will it be formed and bound together in mutual devotion?' 